I'm going to shoot you guys straight at the end there. I sang with the gals first and then I sang with the guys a second time. Did anybody else do that or was it just me? Alright, you did? You sang with the gals and with the guys? Oh, you sang with the guys first and the gals? So we even each other out. Okay, good. So the universe is, is alright. We're good to go there. And of course, now that I tell you that, so the message around today is around focusing and refocusing. Because we're at the beginning of the year. And so I focused on the gals and then I had to refocus on the guys to make sure that we were all together. Very easy to get there. So we are in the very very first part of the year, and this is that time of the year where everyone makes resolutions and promises and all those other kind of things, and for the next 30 days we'll do them, and then uh, the month of February, February actually means in Hebrew, break a resolution, for those of you who didn't know. I made that up completely. But that's what happens. We get to February, March, and we, we have the best intentions at the beginning of the year, but usually about 30 days into it, you really, really struggle. So I was reading last night an article about a gal who said that she stopped making resolutions altogether because what happened was the resolution resolutions were so big that she couldn't keep focused on them for 12 months. And so instead of making it, okay, this is what I'm going to do for the next 12 months, she broke it down to this is what I'm going to do for the next two weeks and the next three weeks. And her parents had taught her that 21 days creates a habit and 30 days creates a habit. So she did it month by month. And every single month, what she found was things that she had implemented the first month had become second nature so that by the second month when she added something to it, then she was, she was good to go for the third month. And then as she went through month by month, she got all these things done. The problem was, and here because there was always a problem, right? I said at the end of the year, she had so many things that she was doing that she got so focused upon those that she lost sight of what was truly important. And so that happens to a lot of us. And so we want to focus, and then at the time when we focus today, we want to then be able to refocus. So this is the time of football playoffs, and tomorrow night's the big, you know, the big college football playoff, which is just really every year a, a rematch between Alabama and Clemson. But right now we're also in the football playoffs, and as I'm watching yesterday, I started thinking about not just how the game is played, but like who the most important people are on the field. Because when you watch a football game, running backs come in and out. Some of them play a lot of plays, but some come in and a third down. Wide receivers come in and out. Uh, even linemen come in and out. But there's two players that in every game that are the, that play the most that are the key to any football game. Some people might argue with me about this and we can have a discussion about it. I don't have any problem. But they are the center and the quarterback. And it's very rare that the quarterback is going to come out unless he's hurt. And it's very rare that a center is going to come out unless he is hurt. But it's the center and the quarterback. And those are the two who touch the ball the most in a football game. We don't think about the center being the one that touches the ball the most. But he has to start every single play. And then it's up to the quarterback to then to take them down the field. But think about this for a second. As a center, he is touching the ball. And he doesn't know where he goes on the next play until they put the ball down again. And then he goes and he snaps the ball back to a guy that he is trusting completely to handle the offense, to run everything, whatever it might be. But then every once in a while, there's a play that happens to where the quarterback gets in a little bit of scrap, and it's up to the center to make the decisions of whether or not to come to the aid of the quarterback. And this is when you can tell just how good a team truly is, because even if they're struggling that day, when that center comes in to send a message, all of his other, the big guys with them come in to send that same message if they truly care about their quarterback. But he has to trust them completely. And the more I look at this, I'm like, man, this is kind of like our life, isn't it? Where I'm, I'm trying to move forward and I want to move forward, but I'm really not sure where this next thing that I did, where it's going to end up. And sometimes it goes really well and I go, you know, three or four yards and then I go forward again and I start to play again. But, but I'm, I'm trusting God is going to handle it and whatever he's going to handle. And then, oh, you know what? This time things went really well and I focused upon him. And, and even though, you know, he's behind me, he's kind of running the show. I trust him enough. And guess what? We went up 10 yards. But then, you know, we're, I'm trying to disciple, I'm trying to mentor, trying to, one of the guys next to me made a mistake, and then I made a mistake, and we had to go back a little bit. So we went back 10 yards or so, but we're like, okay, we're going to trust in God enough, we're going to handle this. And sometimes we go all the way down the field, one after another, and boom, we score right away. Sometimes it's like an 80-yard play, happens out of nowhere, and we score. Other times, we just can't seem to get it right. And it can go on for one play and five plays and ten plays. And it can go on for an entire game. We've got to stop long enough to go back and say, okay, what is it that I need to focus upon? But sadly, I think in our walk, many times, we're so stuck on we want to be the quarterback. And we want to be the ones that are going, I'm going to do this this way. And I'm going to handle things this way. And I'm going to get, you know, ahead by doing this. And I'm going to, and whatever it might be. As opposed to what we don't realize is that every day we're in the trenches. 
And we have to be that center. So that even though God allows us to touch the ball every single play, that we've got to trust enough that there's someone who knows what's going on behind us that is guiding things for us. But as we're moving forward, we're not doing so alone. Just like in football, there's 11 guys that move forward, but there's one that really takes charge of things. And so as we focus and then refocus, what I wanted to start with you guys today is to show you that we start by focusing an area and then we have to refocus in it. But we need to also focus on the fact that we're that center. We aren't that quarterback. God is guiding us. God is leading the offense. God is truly in control. And there are times where it feels like we're going forward. And there are times where we don't go at all. But we need to have the people alongside of us. And we need to trust enough that God is truly in control to take us forward. Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to start today. I'm sure you guys are going to watch some football over here for the next couple days. Watch it and enjoy it tomorrow night. Um, if anybody here is rooting for Alabama, I just want to point out a couple things here real quick. The first thing is their coach is Nick Saban. And Saban, if you change the B and the T, it's Satan. <laughs> I don't think that's a coincidence. Okay. Number two, the quarterback for Clemson is one of the most solid Christian young men that you're going to find. I mean, he is, he's along the same lines of Tim Tebow with every single thing you hear him say. He has taught that from his, not just taught that, but that's part of the reason he went to Clemson is because that head coach, God bless you, is the exact same way. They focus on their faith as far as a team goes. He is a solid, solid, solid individual. Now, is he perfect? Nope. He's never going to be perfect. And he understands that. Man, does he live and walk his faith. So, I don't know how else to tell you this, but root for Clemson tonight. There we go. <clears throat> Just said it. All right. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 is where we're going to start. We've gone through some of these before, some of these verses, and I'll tie in how we went through these verses. But as we're going to focus and refocus, we're going to go around this whole passage. So Jesus is talking. is to have a conversation. He's talking to a whole lot of people, and he's trying to teach them a lesson. So as he's sitting before him, he says this. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21 says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if I ask you, what are your greatest treasures? What is it that when you look at your life, these are the greatest treasures I have? And for some people, it may be the car they drive. For some people, it may be the house that they live in. For some people, it may be some kind of extra thing they have. But for other people, if they stop and go through those things, they start to realize that, you know, those probably really aren't the true treasures that God has blessed me with. God has given me a spouse that, you know, I have friends of mine that are single or that have, have gone through struggles or separation or divorce or things like that, but I have a spouse that walks alongside of me. God has blessed me with children where other people, for whatever reason, they don't have kids. And you know what? I'm, I'm thanking God that I have kids that I can help to grow and to help be more like uh, Christ and to be an example for every day. I have kids that are teenagers and they have friends as well. And I get this opportunity as far as counting them as blessings. And even with where we work with the, the people that God brings into our lives, every single day there are things that we would say, okay, this is where God has brought these treasures. And it could be people we take care of. It could be people that we have discussions with. It could be people that sometimes we haven't even met yet. But God has brought those treasures into our lives. So if I asked you, where are your treasures? And even if you started with something that's material, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I think the more time that you'd spend on it, you would realize that those material things are just material. And if I were to ask you truly, where is your heart? It would go back to the people that are in your lives. Even if it's broken relationships, even if it's struggling relationships, it goes back to those people because that is where you desire to have that treasure. There may be a hole, there may be something missing, and yet you desire to have this before God, but you want them to be the right relationships before God as well. So the first area that we need to focus upon today is our heart. We're going to focus and refocus. So if we focus upon our heart, we talk about it, here's where my treasures are. The, our first thing that we went to are the material things that we have. But then we really thought about when we refocus, where we go to? The relationships. The people. The ones that really matter. And we realize that that is where the true treasures are. So if we're going to go to our heart, we have to pave a road to it. 
And by paving a road, paving a road to something doesn't just happen. It goes over time. It goes over time because we've got to, we've got to start with the path. We've got to clear that path out. We've got to make it an easy place to go through. When you, uh, when you were built a house or the house that you're at, where the driveway was put, was put there for a reason. Whether it's in a smaller neighborhood or in a, a, a somewhere way out in the country, the, the driveway that you have was placed there either because of a housing association or because it fit into the property in the right way. And for some of us, you, uh, like my driveway, when you first start off, it's kind of a gravel thing, and then you go to a cement area. Now, that gravel area where the, where the cars drive over, as we've seen here, we've just lived here for, in our new house for four months, but as we've gone through it, it was nice and smooth when we came in. The people had it set up. It was nice and uh, not paved, but they had the gravel in there, and it looked perfect. Now, let me point out two things here real quick. The first thing is, there was only a couple that was living there. And the second thing is, I have teenagers. And when they drive down this, for whatever reason, that driveway, like I drive really slow and they're always making fun of me. Dad, why are you driving so slow? I'm like, I don't know. I just kind of want to enjoy the drive back. And, but in the back of my mind, it's because I know the faster you drive on it, what's going to happen? You're going to start making potholes. So my NASCAR kids come in. When they come driving in as fast as they can, they're flying down it. Well, guess what we have now? We have all these potholes. So it used to mean you drove down our driveway, you drove like this. Now when you drive down our driveway, you drive like this. Everyone's just, it's just bouncing along. But if you drive with my kids, you're going as fast as you can and you're in the pasture seat holding on because they just want to fly through it. But then all of a sudden you get to the cement. When you get to the cement, it's nice and smooth. And so the drive for, the, for that last part is nice and smooth along the way. This is the same thing when it comes to the road in our heart. It's the same thing when it comes to the treasures that God has blessed us with. We need to pave a path and we need to go over that again and again and again, knowing that God has given that to us. We have to pave that road. We have to continue to drive upon it, knowing that God has paved that road for us. And we have to, have to, have to have it go to our heart. Because if we don't, which is we're going to go in part two here in a second, if we choose not to do so, we're going to continue to have potholes. We're going to, get to continue to have things that are going to be the way. We're going to continue to have obstacles. We're going to have trees falling in front of it. We're going to continue to have things that we have to move. Because God said this and Jesus said this to each one of us. Where your treasures are, that is where your heart is. That is where your heart will be. And it's so easy if we don't take the time to pave that road that so many other things are going to get in the way. And Jesus is warning them. He was warning his disciples. He was warning the people that could listen. He was warning everyone about that, that this is a serious thing to be focused upon. And when you focus upon it, you have to take the time then to refocus. Is this really what God wants? Is this really where God wants me to be? Is this really the kind of people in my life that God wants me to have? Are these people that are lifting me up? Are these people that are going to be a part of that paved road? Or are they going to become potholes? Are they going to become obstacles? Are they going to throw things in there that are going to hurt my heart? And if it's taken us away from God, inevitably, down the road, somewhere, that is what's going to happen. So when we focus, it makes sense in our minds that we should focus with our eyes first, but really we need to focus with our heart first. And we need to refocus there. Some of you had loss and it hurt your heart. Some of you are looking back to your past and it hurt your heart. Some of you are trying to answer the question, what if, and it hurts your heart. Some of you are trying to get something back that you've lost, something that was there and you just want to regain that. Some of it you want to rewind as far as you can go. And when you can't rewind to start back over, it hurts your heart. But you have to realize something. They're treasures. Treat them as treasures. Pave that road. Drive upon it again and it will be smooth when we focus upon it God's way. Jesus continues in this and he says this, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, and we've used these verses before. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So this is not a, hey, we're going to get money kind of, um, it'll bring us more money, bring us more money message. But notice this, you cannot serve both God and money. Jesus knew that the biggest thing, the biggest competition for him, for his, for your heart, for my heart, for my mind, for your mind, the biggest competition is going to be our money. 
But Jesus also knew that there's going to be something that is going to compete with him. Money's just the one that people all talk about because we know it pulls us away. But we can put God and, and you fill in the blank. What is it that competes the most in your life with God? Because you, be, you cannot serve both of them. You can't. You think that you can. You and I think, well, you know, but if I give God a little bit here and if I give this a little bit here, you know, I could try to bring the two together, whatever it might be. But what happens too often is that we lose that focus on God for whatever it is that pulls us away. And it's very, very easy to happen for any one of us. Jesus knew that. And so he's warning you. So he's saying this, hey, pave a road to your heart, but when you're seeing things with your eye, you got to be careful. That looks good. That looks tempting. That looks fun. That looks, that looks, that looks. But here's the thing, at the end of the day, if all those things that look that way, but it's going to hurt your heart, that road that was paved, that you've paved to God, is it truly going to be worth it? And that's where Jesus takes the turn. The next verse, and he says this, Therefore, anytime we see therefore, we stop and say, what is that therefore? I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Other versions say this, guard your thoughts. How often, how often do you think about your thoughts? You ever thought about that? How often do you think about your thoughts? Like you think something and you're like, why did I think that? Like, why am I thinking that way? Why, why, why am I thinking away about that way about that person? Why am I thinking about that person, what they said? Why am I thinking about what that looks like? Or what am I thinking? When do you think about your thoughts? And I would challenge you and say that you think more about your thoughts than you even realize. But also, your thoughts are the very thing that can cause you to lose focus and lose the chance to refocus on God. This morning, I, I usually get up about 6 in the morning on Sunday. I try to go back through everything that I'm going through and, and, and go through, oh, no, I should do this, and now I should add that. And, you know, do I put the story in here? Do I add this illustration here? No, no, it's just going to go. And I go through everything. And what happens is... I, I start to walk. I start to pace. And so this morning, I'm going through the message, and we have a, a fireplace, and I started walking around the fireplace. And as I'm walking around the fireplace, I look down, and I'm like, oh, I have to check what time it is. My thought changed. So I look down at the time. And I'm like, okay, I've got this much time. And as I look at my watch, because Dana got me this cool watch, up in the left-hand corner is this little thing that keeps track of my activity. So I'm like, oh, i got to see how many steps I've had so far. So I hit this little button, and as I'm doing, I'm walking. So now I start counting. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to count to have 25 steps. One, two, three, 24, 20, 25. And I start counting. I'm, I'm going in the circle. I'm like, okay, if I walked around this 25, and then I walked around that thing there, and that would be 20 more. So that'd be 45. Wait, if I get to get 50 steps, and I could do that 20 times, and then all of a sudden I realize, what, why am I thinking about this? Why am I th How did my thoughts get to this? I'm so far away from the things that I'm doing. And so I stop, and as I stop, I look down, and there are my, my two little white dogs. And they're like, their tails are wagging. Because they see me walking, and I'm walking close to the kitchen. So they assume, their thoughts are, he's going to feed me something, which is usually cheese. And so, if you're like me, I have conversations with my dogs. How many people have a conversation with their animal? Be honest, right? And we are sure that for whatever reason, that they understand us, right? Correct? We're sure that we have English speaking and English hearing and English understanding dogs. We have full up conversations. And so I have a conversation with my dogs. I'm like, hey, I'm not here to feed you. I'm, I'm trying to study and go through my message. To which the one dog looks at me and goes like this and turns his head sideways like, I don't know what you're talking about. And the other dog's like, dude, I came for a piece of cheese. Are you going to give me a piece of cheese or what? And he's like, you know, she's trying to like, you know, point me to the refrigerator. Now I'm completely out of focus. I'm worried about how many steps I had. I'm worried about do I have cheese for the dogs. And I am so far away from what it is that I was originally set out to do. And this happens all the time. If you have a smartphone, how many times do you find yourself, I've got to send a text message. Oh, I need to send a text message. I'll throw someone out there. I've got to send a text message to Don. So I go in there and I go in there and I look to, to send a text message to Don and I've got 15 other text messages. So I go, oh, i got to handle this one. I go and answer this one. I go, oh, i got to send this. I gotta, gotta, and I get done and I put it down and I go away and I go and leave what I'm doing. All of a sudden I'm like, I never sent my text message to Don. So then I go back and I pick it up and by then I've got 15 more and I answer, answer, answer. I put it back down and I walk away. I never sent my text message to Don. It happens to me all the time. 
time now. You know why? Because I'm losing focus. So I need to pick up my phone. And the first thing, Don, I'm going to send you a text in a little bit, but I know I'm going to forget. So if you don't get another text from me in 10, 10 minutes, you know, send me a text to remind me to send you back a text. Boom, send. <laughs> focus and refocus, focus and refocus. This is our lives. And here's the sad thing, especially with young people, they're deluged with this. It's in every place of their life because technology, 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 apps, 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 Instagram this and Facebook that and Snapchat this. There's so many things that they have to keep up with, streaks and all this stuff that's going on. You know, when we were younger, let me give you a perfect example. When we were younger, we had to watch a movie. We had to worry about three things. G, P, G, and R. That's all we had to worry about. There's another one, but we're not going to talk about that one. P, or I'm sorry, G, P, G, and R. That's all we had to worry about when we were teenagers. G was general audience. P, G was parental guidance. And R was, I don't even know what R was. It was bad. This is all we knew. In our family, it was G was good, P, G was pretty good, and R was run. That's how we could, if you want to go to a movie, okay? You can go to good, you can go to pretty good, you know, and then you, can, you have to run. That was it. Nowadays, there's so many things on a movie like if I go through a guide and I'm watching I'm like am I even allowed to watch this movie I have to look up and it goes okay one day they added PG-13 and then they added something non NC-17 and then there's R and now there's TVMA and all that kind of stuff it's, it's, it's beyond measure now when we have games they don't have the same rating system there's E and there's T and there's M and Deanna said she saw one the other day that said E-M which means goes from everyone to all the way to mature there's so many choices and so many things are out there there's so many things that pull our thoughts away and it used to be so simple. And if I said to you, if you would just stop long enough to think about how God thought about that, wouldn't it make it way more simple? Wouldn't it make it way easier? If I just stop long enough to think, you know what, what would God really think about that? So that if I focused upon God and then I refocused upon it, where would my thought life be? I wouldn't have to think so much about my thoughts, think about my worries, think about my anxiety, think about my doubt, my struggles, whatever it might be. Think about my past. I wouldn't have to think about any of those things. I would stop and think long enough to say to God, okay God, how do you think about this? Because I have a feeling with the thoughts that I have, I'm trying to play quarterback. When in all reality, I need to play center. When in all re reality, I need to go along as you're going to have me go along. And sometimes you're going to pull me back and I have to be okay with that. Because when I get stuck in those worries and I get stuck in my thoughts, I don't see God at all. I don't recognize God at all. And I never get an opportunity to move forward. And so what Jesus is saying to them and what he's saying to you and what he's saying to me is, listen, I provide every single day. Would you stop long enough to think about that? If you've made it to 25, if you've made it to 30, if you've made it to 50, 75, 78, guess who got you there? I did. Were there bumps along the road? Yeah. Were there things that hurt your heart? Absolutely. Did your thoughts get in the way at times? You bet they did. But if you want to focus and refocus, if you'll start by paving that path to your heart, and then you'll take those thoughts, instead of thinking about those thoughts that you'll think about me, you'll start to see as God sees. And then the struggles that you have, they don't seem nearly as big, do they? Jesus continues and he says this, verse 26, Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Who of you with the thoughts that you have, the struggles in those thoughts, the, the thoughts that you didn't think that you would think, you're not going to add anything to your life. Every time you get stuck in that thought process, every time you get stuck in the, the thought of, I've got to have this much, or we've got to have this much, or this asset, or, or I spent money on this, or I struggled here, or I, I treated this person this way, or I said the wrong words here. Every time we get stuck there, we... Leave God. Think about that for a second. We leave God. It's just us and our thoughts. And God is saying this. I'm providing. I'm giving. Recognize me in those. And you won't have to worry. But if you continue to worry about them, if you continue to struggle in those things, you aren't adding any minutes to your life. Nothing. 
In fact, what you're doing is the opposite. You're completely taking away from what is important. And you've lost focus. So it's time to refocus. The next verse says this, verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of those. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Verse 31, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father's Father knows that you need them. The other version, other version of the Bible says this, this is what the pagans think about. This is what non-believers think about. And their thought process is so stuck in those thoughts that they never think about eternity. Because to them there is no eternity. And yet God keeps providing and providing for them just as He provides for us. Do you know why He does that? Because He loves them just like He loves us. And so if we get so caught in our thoughts and we get so caught up in the latest thing and we get so caught up in the gossip and what everyone else is talking about, we get so caught up into that, how in the world can we ever even show God to others because we're not even thinking about God? We have lost focus. It's the beginning of the year. Let's get focused, and then let's refocus. Jesus continues, and he says this, verse 33. But, and here's the key, seek first his kingdom. Seek first God. Seek first his thoughts. Seek first his heart. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So, Solomon, he brings up Solomon. He gave Solomon whatever wish that he wanted. Solomon, I'm going to give you one wish. You can have whatever it is you want. Whatever it is you want. And so if I asked you right now, God, you could get to one thing from God, what would it be? Most of us would fix something. Or get something. We'd fix some area that we struggled in the past, or we'd get something that if we just had this one thing, that would solve anything. Solomon asked for God's wisdom. He wanted God's wisdom. Because he knew it would change his heart. And you know what God did? God said, I'm not only give you that, I'll give you everything else that you can possibly imagine. He was the richest guy ever. He had everything. He had it all. And you know what it did to him? It got him thinking. It got him thinking. And it got him thinking. And he started looking at things God's eyes and started looking at things through man's eyes. And he wrote an entire book on it called Ecclesiastes. And the first nine chapters of it, you're like, oh my goodness, what is going on with Solomon? He's going to jump off a bridge or something. Then the last three chapters, he finally realizes, God gave me these thoughts and gave me this heart for a reason. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. And there is a way that I can focus upon God. And there is a way that I can not only focus but refocus. And there is a way that I can think about my thoughts so that God sees those. And there is a way that I can pave a path to my heart that goes to God. Because that's where he starts. See, the issue is our heart is here. Our head is here. The difference in between is about a foot and a half. And too many times the thoughts that we think never get to our heart. Because if they did... We'd be more kind. We'd be more empathetic. We'd understand that people have struggles. We'd understand that people have loss. And then our thoughts wouldn't get so off of them and back onto us. Because we look at them as God would look at them. And when we think that way, and when we walk that way, and when we use our heart as part of our thought process, God will give us everything else that goes with it. That doesn't necessarily mean a big bank account. It doesn't mean all the little bells and whistles. It means he will give as God gives and provide for us, which he has done for each one of us to this day, or we wouldn't be here. Next verse. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 34. Therefore, what in the world is that there for? Do not worry. Don't let your thoughts, don't pull your heart away. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Listen to this again. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Ah. 
And if all else fails, drink Mountain Dew, right? No. It's helped me right now. Thank you, Danny. Today, this is the only thing that you're guaranteed. You're only guaranteed the next moment. This is the day that the Lord has made. So if you need to focus and then refocus, you can make every goal you want. There's nothing wrong with that. You want to give back time with your kids? You can set up time with your kids. You want to be more kind to your, to your spouse? You, you can do that any, any day. You want to be a better coworker? The work starts back Monday. Better teammate? Better classmate? All those are wonderful. But don't wait until tomorrow to start. This day you have been given. And so if you want to focus, that's great, but you need to refocus. Because the path to your heart, it needs to be paved. And all those potholes need to be filled over. And your thought process and my thought process needs to be that of thinking of God. Because if I keep thinking about my thoughts, I'm going to get stuck in that again and again and again. So it starts with our heart. It goes to our head. But the challenge starts with this day. So whatever resolution you made, fantastic. But don't think about it for 11 months from now. Focus on it today. And wherever your heart is dark and where it's struggling, focus on it today. And wherever your thoughts are that aren't of God, focus, then refocus on it today. And watch how God will make a change in it. And if you're trying to play quarterback, remember this. God's in control. God's in control. See, the linemen, there's four or five of them that are next to them, three or four of them on both sides. And we need to be there alongside of each other with our arms around each other. One guy's going to snap it, whoever that might be. But if you snap that ball and you stand up and you have no one on you on either side, it's a great way or a great place to start that focus. Because God never intended for any of us to do this alone. But He did intend to do it where He's in charge and not us. Focus, refocus, focus, refocus. It starts with our heart as we pave a path to it. Continues with our thoughts as we think and rethink. And in the end, it's trusting God enough to be God. So therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Challenge yourself to start that focus and that refocus today. Tomorrow. To refocus tomorrow the next day, on that day, and on that day alone. And start to see what God does in your life and the changes it will make from the inside out. Would you all bow your heads, please, we can close in a word of prayer. Mike and Brenda and the team are going to come back up to sing one last song. They're going to sing a song that's, uh, as Mike shared with me, it's kind of an old school invitation song. Where it says, just as I am. It's just as I am. And just as you are, God loves you. We talk about the things that you struggle with your heart. God still loves you, even for that. When you think about the thoughts that you have that you know are not of God, God still loves you despite those. But He doesn't want you to take another day without Him. He doesn't want you to take another day to where it's God on the left and you on the right. I took an hour with Him and I gave Him that hour. He wants to be with you every single moment. If you've never taken the time to ask Him in your heart. If you've never stopped long enough to say, you know what, God, I just really never thought about where my heart is. I need to focus and I need to refocus there. And I've never really thought about the thoughts that I have being separate from you because my thoughts are my thoughts. And I didn't realize that my thoughts could be your thoughts. But too many times I'm like, yeah, I could do that tomorrow. Or I could do that next week. Or I could do that next month. And, and when I get this right, then God, then I'll come to you. <coughs> See, that's you seeking God. But what you don't realize is that God is seeking you. So His ideal is different. 
He looks at you and, say, and says this, just, just right where you're at, just as you are. With the past, with the struggles, with the things you're trying to fix, I got all that. I am seeking you, and I love you enough. You're worthy of my love. So today, what are you waiting for? Today is that day that you give your heart. Today is that day that you can give your thoughts. Today is the day that you can focus and refocus. If you've never stopped long enough to ask Christ in your heart, just right where you sit, know this. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son for it. But God so loved you that He gave His one and only Son for you. And it's a personal decision. If you want to ask Him into your heart today, just right where you sit today, would you just raise your hand? That's a step that you're ready to take. As a church family, we're going to stand here so that we can sing just as I am. We're going to pause for one other time during this. Would you all please rise so we can sing together and worship together as a church family. Thank you.